Welcome, everyone, taking your lunch period to come here and uh, visit. I, my name is Pat Brown. I'm the director of student life and the Davis Center at UVM. Uh, I've been here since 1979, so I've been here 35 years. Uh, and I think that in the last year and a half, I've been asked to talk more about cakewalk and more about this kind of stuff than I have in my previous 33 years. I'm not sure why that is, um, whether there's more freedom to visit about it, talk about it. Um, I, what we're going to talk about today is part of the bigger thing which I talk about, which tries to look at sort of the, the history of diversity and social justice at UVM. And we'll talk, look at a little bit of that here, but we're really going to focus in on cakewalk today. Uh, so I thank you for your time. So for me, as we sit back and sort of talk about what we're going to talk about today, it's important for me to give out, put out some caveats. Um, I'm not a historian. I'm a counselor, student affairs administrator. Um, so I believe history has filters. Uh, I've attended many things here, takeovers of the president's wing, and then I go watch the news, and it's like, well, that didn't happen. How did that get on the news? So even what we see on TV sometimes is filtered. So for me, it's important for you to think about that, that history has filters, mine as well as others, and I've taken information from a lot of other people. So there's multiple sources, perspectives, and stories. So we're just going to begin to take a look at it today. As I begin to look and sort of go back in time and think about words we've even used on this campus, and we won't look at some of them, but when I started working here, we talked about minority students. Uh, we had a minority student program. We had a minority student panel that was working with Laddie Corps in 1987 and 88 to begin to look at how to make the campus be different. So I put up here just some of the words that have been around. Uh, some of the more recent words of multicultural, multicultural diversity, um, anti-racism, institutional racism, when that became part of the conversation on this campus, folks had problems trying to figure out what that was. Uh, not everybody, but a lot of people on campus. Um, cultural pluralism, social justice, cumulative impact, Microaggressions is a word we're using today a lot, where somebody says something and it's a microaggression to somebody else. Gets into intent versus impact. Uh, in my conversation today, my intent is not to offend anybody, uh, but I could very well say something and it may impact somebody in a way that I had no intention of that happening. So it's part of the conversation we've had of people feeling free to turn around and pat and say, Pat, what you said, it, it triggered me. Uh, so that's, again, part of where we've, where we've sort of been moving. Sometimes, for me, the words create complexities that make it hard to have conversations. So many times we have problems getting over that part. Um, historically, UVM is a predominantly white institution, uh, still is, was back in, in 1791 when it was first founded. It's important for me to look at change being very slow at times. On this campus, students have had a, an amazing impact of who we are as an institution. And again, some of the images I might show, show might trigger you, and if you need to leave, feel free to do that, uh, but you need to take care of yourself. If you have questions as I go, feel free to stop, raise your hand, say, Pat, i got questions about that. So my goals for today is review briefly some historical realities of what shaped UVM. I was asked to look specifically at Cakewalk as part of UVM's tradition. Um, part of that will look at sort of what's changed over the years, particularly around the late 60s, mid to late 60s, and how campus traditions on this campus, uh, sort of many of them left sort of in a time period of about five years, which feels like a really long time, but in t institutional history, not that long ago. Uh, anybody go here as an undergraduate in UVM prior to 1970? So we have one. Here. No. So, so we're going to take a look at that. So for me, stepping back and just taking a big, broad brushstroke looking at UVM, the Republic of Vermont, its original constitution, 1777, before we were a state, actually outlawed slavery. It said that all men are born equally free and independent. And as I did more research, I used to just stop right there. Uh, but I added but, dot, 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 because as I've begun to dig in a little bit, uh, yeah, kind of. And that's another whole conversation. So, so you can look at the language and begin to look and sort of say, well, it means this. But did it actually mean that and how it was practiced and what came out? UVM was founded, as many of us know, in 1791. Um, and our charter forbids, and these are words from our charter as a university, that preference to any religious sect or denomination whatsoever. And many folks look at that as, a, as an openness of the University of Vermont. Uh, a lot of post-secondary education back in that time was really dealing with folks who are part of uh, religious denominations. So we out, put it out front that we didn't, that wasn't part of who we were. 
back in 1791. UVM as an institution uh, graduated our first African-American student in 1838, part of the history. Uh, in 1875, another part, uh, Ellen Hamilton and Lydda Mason were inducted into Phi Beta Kappa. Phi Beta Kappa, if you don't know, is an undergraduate academic honor society. Uh, this induction of women happened in Vermont. Think about that, in 1875. And Phi Beta Kappa was 101 years old at that time. So they went for 101 years and only admitted men. Two years later, uh, UVM admitted George Washington Henderson uh, to our chapter Phi Beta Kappa in 1877. So if you step back and look at where UVM has come, there's some pretty interesting things uh, leading up to uh, um, cakewalk as being part of who we were as an institution, institution late 1800s. This is what I've been able to come up with as I go back and sort of look. Uh, cakewalk was, uh, has been identified as a 19th century dance invented by African Americans to satirize the stiff ballroom promenades of the white slave owners. So the actual dance and the physical dance has been tied back to the satirization. Then becoming part of, the, part of a dynamic, the slaves were asked to perform for guests. The best dancers received slices of cake. That's how it became known as cakewalk. Um, after emancipation, the tradition continued from what I could find uh, amongst African American communities of doing the dance and doing performances. Um, and then it became part of a national, nationwide fad in the late 1890s and began to move northward from the south. So some of the questions pop up, well, where did it come from? And this sort of gives you a sense of where it came from um, and how it got to UVM. Uh, in 2004, we had a library display that looked at a whole bunch of different things related to cakewalk. And I've just put up some words here because it's important for me when you begin to think about an institution and what are we willing to talk about about our history. Because there are all kinds of things related to our institution historically that don't necessarily fall, that fall on, I won't say known as, they fall on the really negative side of society. We were part of a eugenics program back in the 1930s that was, again, nationally part of sort of where we were. We were engaged on that in, in all kinds of ways. So some, some different words here of Willie Coleman was the vice provost for multicultural affairs at the time talking about students of color having two opposite reactions to the display. Um, some will say, why are you doing this? Why are you talking about this? Another one saying, we really need to step back and look at race and racism in the United States and how it played out on this campus. So as I said, I've, I've, I've probably not had many of these conversations in the past uh, 35 years, but recently in the, in the past, uh, past couple years. And here's a quote that I put up from Jim Lowen, who's um, a former and retired sociology professor at UVM. In, in, in um, 1991, we had a book looking at the UVM's first 200 years, and he talked quite a bit about cakewalk. And, I think it's important to sort of look at his words um, and how he defined the actual cakewalk as being culturally racist. And in my conversations with alums who were here, who participated in it, that's a very difficult conversation to have. Um, and you should know that that's still part of a conversation from alumni at UVM. Um, any questions? I've got some videos I'd like to show you and then sort of take it from there. Questions? No? Okay. So I'm going to show you two videos so that you can see some, some of what... Yeah, okay. And this is a 30-minute video. It's actually at the library if you want to pursue it. But uh, we'll watch uh, 10 or 15 minutes of it. Tonight's focus three will be 
invite you to enjoy a close look at one of the happiest moments of any Vermont winner, the Union Yankee Cakewalk. The ball began in 1894, this oldest collegiate winter carnival in the nation. A little bit anyone realized at the time that Cake Walk was much older than the era of Valley Beach today. One night, eight or ten undergraduates who called themselves the Hatback Boys adopted an old Stephanie Harvard band and effectively threw a candle to the military ball. The Cake Walk was the first time that 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 Cake Walk was the which was, at that time, the main building on campus. Just how the name of Cape Walk originated isn't known, but it's stuck ever since. But the name is about the only thing that has remained the same. Perhaps the most startling change has been in the costumes. In the early days of Cape Walk, the walkers dressed as soldiers, playing cards, dice, flowers, snowballs, safeties, policemen, South Sea Islanders, and women. But in fact, neither female students nor the public were admitted to the first cakewalk, which are chronicled as having been rather wild, weird, spicy, and spirited. They also saw their share of rides and brawls. The events became so boisterous that the faculty banished it from campus, and for a number of years it was presented at public halls in Burlington. At the turn of the century, however, when the athletic department's coffers were all but drained, cakewalk was reinstated as a financial crux. It was made public and was based in the old university gymnasium. Soon after the turn of the century, the Kirk Walk Skits, or stunts as they were called then, had become an important part of the festivities. Cakes were awarded to the winners of both the stunts and the walking. In those days, each fraternity was allowed 15 minutes in which to set up a scenery and props, present its skits, and then clear the floor. Then, as now, the stunts dealt for the most part with parent happenings. By the mid-30s, Cake Walk had grown in size as well as popularity, and it was shifted from the old gymnasium to Burlington Community Dose Memorial Auditorium, and there it stayed until 1963. Other changes were to be made during the Memorial Auditorium days. For one thing, the varied and more comical costumes of the walkers were to disappear, and a standard musical outfit was to be adopted. The skits were reduced in both number and length, but the rifle dazzle and the split second timing of their presentation have carried on through the years, and so have their podcasts at the faculty and administration. By now, the audience had well more than tripled from the 800 persons who attended the event in 1900, and the Memorial Auditorium was bursting at the scene. In 1963, with the completion of the university's museum, Kirk Walk was to move again. And now, although it had room to breathe, one of its first traditions was soon to be stifled. For Kirk Walk was not without its pressures as a result of the Civil Rights Movement. The 1964 performance was staged without the use of black-faced makeup, and today it has been replaced with a dark green. One tradition that has remained, a tradition as much a part of Kirk Walk as the walking itself, is the song Cotton Days. Written by composer Percy Wenrick, it came on the scene in 1903. But that it has remained as the Kirk Walk theme song is due to the university's Dr. Joseph Lechner. In 1929, when every Uvian copy of Cotton Days was destroyed in a fire and no others could be found, Dr. Lechner rewrote from memory the complete score for all instruments. For 62 Kirk Walk, audiences have thrilled to the contagious strains of Cotton Days and the odds are that it will have the same spellbinding effect on its 63rd audience. Here lies the backbone of Cake Walk, the Cake Walk Director's Office. Three directors, four assistants, and a secretary, all students, devote most, if not all, of their spare time to making this activity possible. Steve, I don't know what we're going to do about these two tickets. There's one next to the five and a half, and I'm not sure what you're going to do about them. What do you think? Well, how many tickets do we have remaining Friday night? Well, look, we have this one section up here, but we're going to be sold out pretty soon, I think, so. Oh, I think we should hold these possibly the downtown sale, but for the last minute sale coming along. So why don't you just set the little surprise for the time being? Do that with us, uh, I think we ought to ask Lieutenant Governor Daly for a nice liquor cup. Can we get uh, one off again? Lieutenant, 
extra conferences and is presented along with the cake wrapping. And like the wrapping involves weeks of preparation. But there are two parts of each skit that the audience never sees, the entrance and the exit. The community members have but seven or eight seconds without the benefit of lightning to get their scenery, props, and themselves on stage, in position, and ready to go when the lights come up. This is the way it would look if you could see it. for the walking starts in November, some three months before the competition. It's a strenuous, often grueling task. The walkers must not only be in top physical condition, they must possess a determination that just won't quit and the patience to strive for excellence. Their coaches, of course, must possess the same qualities. Peter McGallagher is one such coach. He's been putting his Kappa Sigma fraternity team through its paces. When that moment of truth arrives, what will the judges be looking for? Well, they're looking for the head and shoulders back and the body off. Your hands at one end up to the floor, and your hands fully extended when they go up. Also, on the kick, looking for the thigh, all over the floor, picking out with your toe extended. And then, of course, at the end of the decision, you can work and walk in the direction together. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
questions, observations? Yeah. Um, so you brought up alumni, mm -hmm. and you brought up um, the important aspect that, it's, that it was inherently culturally racist. Mm -hmm. What I also saw in the video, me personally, was that strong sense of like community building that we as student mm -hmm. affairs professionals mm -hmm. often are doing. And so when you're talking alums, what advice might you give to somebody who's doing alum work or connecting with alums that were connected with that during that period? In those to navigate those difficult conversations where they still feel that mm -hmm. fostered sense of community building mm -hmm. um, while still acknowledging the pain and inherent racism that that also carries. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. You know, it's I actually did some work with the foundation. Foundation. Uh, that's sort of where this came from. Tiffany asked me to come do it because of that that question of what's like, so how do you get there and um, so if I were to create a context uh, on our campus, uh, Winter Carnival had sort of three components. There was sort of, there were performances, musical performances, and I'll show you in a little bit some pictures that came out of programs. There was, so the part of that was a ball, a winter ball. There's a king and a queen, sort of the old traditional king and queen. So that was part of the weekend. This other part of it was skits, where students did skits spoofing things that went on um, in the area. I don't know what the content is, but when I was, uh, transferred as a transfer student to University of Florida in 1971. Um, they were still doing skits as part of their homecoming program in part of the big thing they called Gator Growl. And then the other part was cakewalk. Uh, for me, if you go back and I think look at this as, a, as part of the university's history and tradition, the gathering of people, the community, the sense was, was what's there. Cakewalk was the mechanism to do that. And I think for me, having had those conversations with alumni, I come back and really try to begin to figure out what did they, what did they, what did they like about it? And it isn't so much cakewalk, it's the fact that they were all together. And the videotape talks about sort of starting on campus, growing out of here, having to move down to Memorial Auditorium, having grown out of that space, coming back up to Patrick Jim, uh, a couple years after Patrick Jim was built. And when I came to work here, there were still plaques at Patrick Jim, uh, thanking the cakewalk committee for installing the sound system in the new Patrick Gym. So it's, for me, it's really getting back of, so what did, you, what did you like about that, which is, for me, part of the conversation. It's hard to have. Um, I know some of our students have called up and asked for donations, and people still won't give money to the university because of that. Good question. Yep. Yep, you know, it's, um, it's, um, it was a student program. It came from students. Um, and I got some dates I'll show up here in a little bit. It's sort of the process of it going away and actually have the press release, which I'll read from the students who decided to make it go away. But for some students who were there, or alums, it was a really, it, that's how they identified with the institution. Uh, if you go back in that time into the early 1900s up to like 19, uh, 1955, 1960, with some pivotal years for UVM where the University of Vermont merged with the State Agricultural College, um, our enrollment changed dramatically. Um, a lot of students back prior to that time, a large percentage of our students are members of fraternities and sororities, probably, I don't know, 50, 60 percent, maybe higher. Um, when I came to work in seven nights, 14 percent. So that, that, the, in, this institution began to change in all kinds of different ways. Um, football gets brought up many times as well because it went away in 1974. So some of those traditional things, not that cakewalk was traditional across the country, um, but some of those things that pull people together in, on this, in the traditions of this campus went away. Yeah? What ended the tradition? Um, and who, who spearheaded the? Well, let me, let me, can we watch one more little bit of a video and then we'll come back and I'll answer that, Stacy? So I want to. So I want to, this is a part of a video, it's a half hour video again, it's at the library of, we had to take over the President's office in 1988, uh, raising questions around racism, cultural diversity on campus, and change, wanting to change the institution. And the first little bit here I want to show, it's probably about three or four minutes, because um, I think it's important to have voices. Larry McCrory, who was a faculty member here, is in the first little bit of this video talking about when he came to campus um, and being asked to go to Cakewalk. The panel of mediators
years of my, as I mentioned, work all through the night and uh, literally hundreds on this campus and this community who cared and who've been involved and who I now join with these students in asking to help us together make this a reality. We can agree it takes a community, not just today and the intensity of this moment, but next week and next month and through the years ahead to make this a reality. Cultural diversity is and will be an integral part of this university. And for that, I am proud, and I know all of us in this university will be proud. racism every day, but they were confronted with it in the spring of 1988 when minority students took over the offices of the president. They demanded an end to the overt and institutional racism on their campus. President Coor himself admitted in a memo to the campus following the takeover, quote, our record in recent years has not been impressive. He noted a drop in black undergraduates from a high of 70 in the mid-70s to 40 in 1988. Also in 1985, the number of minority faculty had remained constant for 10 years, a meager 11. To top it off, Kaur added that there had been very little activity in adding courses and programs that represented the richness and diversity of subject matter embraced in the minority experience. The entire campus struggled with racism in a way it hadn't since the end of Cakewalk. Cakewalk consisted of fraternity members imitating dances which black slaves were forced to perform for their master. So Stacy, what I would say to answer your question is, is that as, as Larry was talking about, the, 
The, there was, I think, as best as I can tell, as we went into the 60s, 60s, more questions on campus about, so what are we doing? How are we doing it? What, how is it happening? Uh, students struggled with how to make, how to deal with it, from my perspective. They did one year without any blackface. They went, switched to greenface, thought that would be fine. Um, and in the end, they decided not, not to do it. There were, um, I'm going to. So you're saying the students themselves. Yes. Were... Yep. Here's, here's uh, the press release, the actual press release I found from students from October 31st, 1969. You're a first year student here, right? I'll, I'll read it to you because it's important. We, the, the directors of the 73rd Annual Cakewalk Winter Weekend at the University of Vermont, after much deliberations and consideration of the controversy that has grown on this campus since the spring of 1969 concerning the very existence of Cakewalk, have reached the following decision. As of this date, the theme of Cakewalk and all of its inferences and manifestations are eliminated from the University of Vermont Winter Weekend. In these sensitive times, it is it is possible to interpret this tradition as being racist in nature and humiliating uh, the black people of this nation. We feel that no amount of tradition and longevity can be used as a defense for the, cont for the continuation of cakewalk. One of the stated responsibilities of our university is to quote, that of creating a community of scholars, both young and old, of providing an atmosphere for discovery, exchange, and transmission of ideas. Since Cakewalk prohibited the blacks' total integration into this community, we have undertaken the abolition of the, of the offensive elements of the winter weekend to allow the realization of this goal. Uh, the event on February 12, 13, 14th in 1970 will be the University of Vermont Winter Music and Film Festival. So students decided to stop it. A lot of folks, if you go back, and I've got some, just some pictures here of... Uh, some cakewalk programs. But if you were to go back and look at, um, again, this is inside the program, some of the talent that was on, on campus um, during that time, Duke Ellington, um, Count Basie, part of the, the weekend activities. If you were to go back and sort of look at the process of it be, being disappearing from campus, it was really students who made that decision. Some of the alums would say that it was administrators forcing the students to do that. And if you were to go back, I skipped a slide. If you were to go back and look at um, the timing, the dean of students at the time was part of the conversation. So you can sort of see here in the 60s and 70s, uh, the dean of students began to ask questions about that. So there was conversation on campus, just not students. It was faculty, it was, as you heard Larry talk about administrators when he came to campus as well, raising that question. Other question? Yeah. I always wondered, why was it that they had to go back? They went from black to white to a dark green that was almost black. Mm -hmm. Why were they unable to just leave it in white? Anybody ever uh, anything you find to actually I've, talk about that? I've, I've, I, I haven't found anything that talks specifically about that. You know, my, my assumption, which is really just my assumption, is that painting the face was so much part of what the performance was that when they did it without, they probably turned it around and said it just didn't feel complete. I'm putting words in students' mouths, but having worked so with students. And, and when you are in painted, painted face. face, yeah. There's that, a, that's you know, a part of it too. You, you, you can be more free and open and, you know, yeah. So they tried to, yeah. Just yeah, yeah, no, it's. And it's, and it's hard to find. I mean, it would be great to find somebody who was around at that time, who was a director of it, who could sit back and look at and have a conversation around that. But I haven't found much written about it. There's actually a lot of good resources in the library that you can go back through and sort of take a look at programs and videotapes and some of those other kinds of things. Other questions? Yeah? Something I found striking in the narration at the beginning, and of course, we didn't see the whole video, but it seemed to be just devoid of any consciousness around the racial dynamics. I mean, there's a, a piece about the civil rights movement, but I, I was so struck by just that lack of consciousness. And I thought, and you know, maybe other folks saw it or didn't, I thought I saw some photos of people dressed in KKK outfits. Mm -hmm. So I guess it made me wonder, like, how could it not be racialized, or how could people see it as neutral <coughs> with, like, a KKK looming in the background, or that? So, mm -hmm. so I'm just, I'm trying to, to 
to understand the cognitive dissonance that must have been at play to allow people who probably thought they were good, you know, community students and folks, um, but that dissonance is something that I'm just trying to wrap my head around. So I guess I don't have a question. I guess I'm just trying to. No, that's fine. That's fine. You know, you know, Lucretia, for me, I, I, I do think there, there, there's just like a lack of community consciousness about all of it. You know, part of it's the time. Uh, I grew up in the South, and I can remember water fountains for colored and water fountains for, for white folks. And they're the same water, water fountains. And the same one. It's sort of like, when did that consciousness come to say, that can't be there? And I think for me, a lot of that became part of what was going on in the 60s and beginning to say, so yeah, this just isn't, this isn't right. We need to figure out a way to make it be better. Yeah, go back here, then over here. Yeah. So when I was growing up, I grew up in a very small community in Wisconsin, farming community. Uh, there were no people of any color or minority groups in the small town I grew up in. And we had minstrel shows, yep. black-faced minstrel shows. And then they went to white-faced for about a year or two and then died. Uh, and I think part of it is that the comment was made before that by blackening one's face, you could do things that you might not otherwise do just because your your personality is covered. But the other thing that is is different in that period of time was the onset of all the other entertainment uh, vehicles that we had. Because because going up to that period of time, TV wasn't quite as strong, it wasn't as good. Um, and, and this was a, a source of, of entertainment for the community. So and then and then it was starting to lose its you know point of view. It's, it's really it's really as a result of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Over here, that over here. Yeah. Uh, my question's on money. Mm -hmm. I, obviously, there's the kind of ongoing question of alumni and alumni donors. But I was also wondering about athletics because there's so, I thought there was something in the video they talked about sort of the dire straits of the, of the athletic yep. budget, and I didn't quite understand how this was tied yep. to that and how it. At some level, maybe a lot of it was about money. Somehow, I don't know if that's true. It just seemed like that way. Uh, it's. I would. I would assume so. I don't know that specifically. It talked about the coffers needing money and, and it moving back to campus. I'm sure that the gym rented out the space to the cakewalk committee to do their program, uh, or they paid for some program. So I'm sure that that was that. From what this reporter said, that was a part of a driving force in history. Other than this video and that person saying that I don't have anything. Uh, that would substantiate that. Um, if you were to walk in the library, the Bailey Howe Library today, walk through the little magic arms that keep you from running away with books, and over on the right there's sort of a glassed-in greenhouse area, there's a plaque of donors to the building. And there's two plaques that say uh, contributions from the Cakewalk Committee. And we've had conversations about whether to take them down or whether to leave them there but put something up that talks about what it was. And in the, when I've worked with students and had these conversations, the first reaction is take it down. We don't want that part of there. Then, then after a while, they begin to, well, but if we take it down, then we'll never have the conversation. And again, UVM is one blip in sort of a bigger cultural, social phenomenon in my eyes. And if we take it down, then we lose that opportunity to somehow use it as a way to teach. So it's, it's yeah, money was moved around, and I don't know if they charged fraternities to participate. I don't know where their money came from. Um, but clearly, money was part of that conversation. Yeah? So my question is, during that time, were there other schools, like Howard University, doing white face? I mean, was there, <laughs> <laughs> was there, you know, was there, or, were there other schools doing the same thing, or was it just because you were in Vermont, you were so, just so oblivious to the rest of the world? You know, I will, uh, there was a quote early on from Willie Coleman, who was interviewed as part of that uh, display at the library, and she quotes it saying that, it, that we're the place where it stayed the longest. So beyond that, I don't know whether it happened other places. Clearly the dance moved north, as, as history would say, whether it became part of winter carnivals and other places, um, I don't know. Yeah? With respect to the money, I was just going to point out that this, program cost 50 cents in 1964, and, and in 1964, you know, candy bar cost a nickel. Uh, so if you go back, there yep. it is, 50 cents. Oh, yeah. So it, it, clearly, they're, they're raising a lot of money mm -hmm. from, uh, from this. From utilities. Yeah. Yeah. 
I was just curious because Lucretia was saying some things that were connecting with what I'm thinking. Has your research shown at all a, a, either an informal or formal documented connection with the Ku Klux Klan? I mean, even just looking at the spelling, the yeah, KKK, you know, is there, have you actually found documentation? Because when I've talked to people about cakewalk in the past, some people have said, have made this connection themselves and obviously we saw the photo of, of someone dressed in full clan outfit right there and so <coughs> I'm not sure if I would even buy the argument that it wasn't like through the narration it wasn't even consciously uh, racialized or maybe it was just consciously ignored because even that late um, there was still you know at that point we had we knew that it wasn't necessarily great to be associated with the KKK, mm -hmm. and, the his, and, mm -hmm. and historically, um, that was where the sheets even came from themselves, uh, was not to be seen or known who you were. So I just wondered if, there, if you mm -hmm. had come across any mm -hmm. actual historical... Nothing specifically. Uh, clearly the pictures that were here, that was one. Um, if you were to Google cakewalk and sort of dig around and try to find it and spell it with a K, it keeps self-correcting to see. Um, so I don't know whether that was so unique and it was unique to UVM. So I don't know. I haven't dug that deep into it. If I was a history professor, I'd probably be able to answer all these questions. It, I know it started in 1897. Was it somewhere around uh, yep. there? Was it always spelled with three Ks? As far as I've been able to determine, yes. And I actually have seen some things where this K and this K and this K are bigger, are bigger yes. have a different color, mm -hmm. and you begin to raise questions yeah. of like saying, so uh, what was going on in 1935? And I don't know what the answers are to that. But clearly that was, the, the first K is not the typical way we would spell cakewalk. And cakewalk is part of our language. It means doing something that's sort of easy. Uh, when my kids were at Williston Central School, they did a cakewalk as part of the festival, and it was uh, musical cakes. So being the parent that I was, right? Huh? No, no, with a C. Well, I, I, I wouldn't even have the C. I mean, I was the parent who sort of said, well, do you all know where this came from? And they all look at me, well, no, it's just cakewalk. We're going to raise money for the school. And I'm like saying, no, 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 no. So we had this whole conversation. And for the years that my kids were in school, it was referred to as musical cakes. The next year when my kids left, it went back to cakewalk. Yeah. So it's that's sort of part of the, it is part of that question of teaching and getting people to be aware. And for some people, yeah, Matt. I have a question about how to engage in a conversation about this. I've had conversations with donors from the 50s who speak with glowing pride about their involvement in yep. this. And for me, it just shuts down the conversation because mm -hmm. I don't even know where to go with that. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any advice for Well, I think that's sort of the question earlier. You know, I, I think. For me personally, it may depend upon how well I know the person and how can I get to know the person before I get to that conversation. That's one. Uh, where is that conversation happening? If it's on the phone and I can't see facial expressions, how do I get in that kind of conversation? That's a tough one. Uh, I've had those conversations in group, group settings with a group of alumni. And it's like, oh, really? You know, I just, <clears throat> and, it, and it's that, that process, I think, of stepping back. And part of it is, the folks I know who have engaged deep into it, they do not want to accept that the behavior was racist. Because if they did it, then they're racist. And trying to get them to sort of step back and look at part of that social consciousness that was going on, not that it was OK back then, but there weren't questions about it in the general population. My sense is at UVM, the very few African-American students we had on campus, it was always questions with them. But us sort of white folks who walk around with the privilege that we do, uh, no, I don't think until the 60s when the questions began to surface more in the country on a global scale that it became part of the dialogue on our campus. So for me, it's how do you get to the point of talking about that when inherently when you begin to talk about it, you're telling somebody they're racist and they don't want to be told that. It's hard. So we can talk more about it, but I think it sort of depends upon the setting you're in, who the person is. Um, other questions? Yeah. Yeah. And maybe give more because what you did. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, that, and that's where, you know, I've had conversations with folks in the foundation about this too. And we were, you know, I was asked to come in and have a similar conversation. And I'm like, I think there has to be a point where the foundation has to decide do we engage these people or not? That's it. There's no, you're never going to change their mindset around this, this event or activity. I mean, they have lived very long lives, the, the people that we're talking about here. If they're at this, if they're at the point in their life where they still don't recognize that this is racist and that they participated in racist activities, well then you're not going to change their mindset or their, their feelings. And that, at that point to me, it's, you just have to disengage. And I don't know, I, I mean, I don't know how wealthy these people are. I don't know anything about these people, um, certainly. I'm not in that area of the university, but you, you have to take a stand. The university has to just decide one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not sure that that's true for everyone. And the only reason why I say this is, is last night before I went to bed, I was watching the uh, Larry Wilborn show on Comedy Central, and, and, and he had a clip from George Wallace uh, at the height of his uh, of his uh, power, and uh, you know, segregation now, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And then he had a clip from the last year of his life, in which he basically recanted all. Yeah. And, uh, and and so you know there could be a redemptive quality of this, mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. say that um, okay, this is what happened then. And uh, but 50 years, literally 50 years later, there's a redemptive quality uh, to, to and, and you know who knows what they really feel now. I mean, they did those things then, and and, and there may be a, a way mm -hmm. to to create healing uh, mm -hmm. out of that. And you know, and what's the best way to apply healing? Money. <laughs> well, I, what I mean by or that it's is a good a, way for, yeah. for, a, for the development. So just to clarify, I, what I'm ta I've heard a lot of folks in the foundation talk about cold calling or, or calling someone and them saying, I'm not giving money until you bring back cakewalk. I think those people, I don't know if they can be pull, pulled over to the other side. I, I don't know. I, I, I agree. If there's someone who's like, I love cakewalk. It was a great experience. I, I know that it doesn't fit into the, to the scope now. And you know, can we engage those people differently and, and create some sort of Bridge. I, I, I agree with you, yeah. but I'm just talking about those staunch people who are just... The, the, the issue, you know, being here at the College of Medicine, we always talk about the, the value of anecdotal versus actual data, and, and, you know, who knows what the data are? I mean, everyone remembers the, 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 the racist on the phone who says, I'm not giving any money for cakewalk, right. but it's not, maybe there's 99 people for every person that, that, that say, yeah, boy, that was an embarrassing... Well, so for me, I think that gets back to the question: How do you how do you engage in that conversation? And it's uh, I would say that it's really would be good to practice. I think when I did work with the foundation, I came with some case studies and said, "So here, you get a phone call like this. How are you going to respond?" Because they sometimes, well, for myself, I've been surprised when all of a sudden it's like out of nowhere this question pops up or someone makes a comment, and I'm like saying, "I, I need to I I hear it." I'm triggered by it, so I need to now figure out how I'm going to address it. And it may be taking somebody out of a room with a group of people and saying, Let's, I need to have a conversation with you about something you said. So it really is, for me, contextual and situational, and it's a relationship of what do you know. So it may be that there's people who just say that on the phone and they hang up, uh, or it could be that there's more, there's an opportunity to have a dialogue. And, and they're used to saying, Harry's not answer. Well, yeah. are, we, are we actually engaging them effectively? And, and in that conversation. So when somebody says to me, oh, I'm not giving you uh, uh, any money until, I'm imagining myself as a development person, not a development person. And I'm imagining if somebody said to me, oh, I'm not going to give you any money until you bring back Cakewalk. And I say, well, what was it about Cakewalk that you feel so passionate about 40 years later, OK, maybe I'd be a little nicer, that you are this still feeling this way? And then engaging in that. Well, maybe it's about the camaraderie. Maybe it's about the sense of community building or um, the, all the hard work and physical labor and time and effort. And, and, and now they feel like all those years and that time and that effort that they put into that, it's hard for them to let go of that, for that individual 
looking back on their life and their legacy. Because that was their experience. And so, right. yeah. and so are you engaging converse, this converse, as, as part of legacy and what might, and then say, well, let me talk about all the different ways in which we do that here still today on this campus. Mm -hmm. It just looks differently. Mm -hmm. And are you connected, are you in, are you plugged in to the student community, uh, the people like Pat Brown and Stacey Miller, for example, who are facing students every day doing this exact work? It just looks different now. So we'll take I one more from Sarah, because I got a few, I don't, I don't want this, this isn't a foundation conversation, because no, I, I want to come back and tie it into the fact yeah. that this is part of our history, and, and, it, and, and even though this was very blatant, if I talk to students on campus or staff on campus, it's the covert stuff that's still going on that we don't talk about. So there's another story behind this for me that's really important is to understand that this is part of our history but we're actually living a history now where some of those same kinds of things are happening and some of us don't even know it. But Sarah, think. Yeah, I was just basically going to say, I do have this conversation pretty much once a month. Um, <laughs> and 99% of the time, I can convert them into believing in what UVM is now. Um, but I think the biggest thing is I have to, and I do, typically try and turn it to, what was UVM for you? And it usually goes back to the community. And then I can take that and say, well, wow, your community is even larger, and it's doing even better things than it was doing 50 years ago and 75 years ago. Um, there are a dozen hardballs out there who we are never going to change. And at, to your point, Stacey, we have to let them live their life. Um, but at the same time, I think I've been able to, and I think Pat Brown and everybody's been able to help to say, what is UVM now? Because they are so stuck in what UVM was. And you have to value that because that was their experience. Mm -hmm. But we also have to show them that their experience is a part of the larger community. Um, and most people get there, but it takes a long time. Well, it's, so for me, another piece of it is the context of UVM back when all this, the questions are coming up around Cakewalk, had a whole bunch of other things. There's a civil rights piece which sort of got that consciousness level up. Student rights, people taking over the ROTC building here. 1,200 people being arrested at the University of Florida where I was at. All these different things raising questions about student rights because back then the age of majority was 21. You couldn't vote, you couldn't own property. That was the way it was. The Vietnam War was another part of that. So there was all kinds of things that were growing out of college campuses, whole anti-establishment values. Across the country at that time in the late 60s, early 70s, interest in fraternity sororities dropped. So I'm going to show you some slides in a bit, look at numbers at UVM. And we began to continue to grow in enrollment. So as membership in fraternity sororities on this campus dropped, our enrollment kept going up, which meant the percentage of students who were affiliated with chapters went down quite so a bit. It's the same conversation that I had with alums who were in the 80s who got rid of Oktoberfest. Right. They hate UVM because UVM got rid of Oktoberfest. Obviously, very historically different background. Um, but it's interesting to see how UVM has changed so dramatically. And we still have a population of alums who think UVM is what it was. Right. And we can talk about football. We can talk yeah. about <laughs> baseball. I mean, there's things that go away and it end up being questions. But this is, a, this is a reality that for me is a really, really interesting reality when you think about UVM when we became the University of Vermont in state agriculture in 1955, we had 2,500, 2,581 students. In 1966, we had 3,800. That's an increase in 11 years of 1,300 students. That's a lot. And then you go here to 1969 when Cakewalk went away and we went from here to there, or you can go from 61. We, we grew tremendously as an institution. So while all this stuff was going on, we had more and more students on campus at a time when there weren't as many of those community things pulling people together. I put this up here because I think if I were to go back and look at some of the conversations we've had on campus recently and beginning to engage people in conversations that really looking at identities and dominant subordinated identities and what that begins to look like and how that plays itself out as just again part of a framework of some of the current sort of conversations on campus today um, as opposed to what it was even 15 years ago. And I'll leave this up there and see if there's any other questions or comments. Sure, but. We used to show bamboozles in Cape Walk, mm -hmm. and on a couple of occasions we had alumni show up who were distressed at the possibility that Cape Walk was being framed as a race for that. And part of what I heard, <laughs> to me, that's, that was the truth. Yep. And I think everything everybody said is that one of them was adamant that this was the most pivotal event in his college life. And was passionate, was 
deeply passionate and was unable to, you know, phrase cognitive dissonance, however, was not able to think of two competing ideas at the same time, that that could be true and that it could still be problematically racist. And so what I hear from some people is a seeking of absolution. Forgive me, I'm 13 years in the Catholic school. And they want somebody else to tell them that, that it was okay. They want to be absolved of any wrongdoing. And then they can move on. And if you're not willing to do that, that's what they keep seeking, to move on. Or, as was said, divert it to that aspect that was positive for them. And they agree to not talk about it. Agree to that this, we will not go there, and then they'll be okay. Um, it still begs the question of where the if you want to use it, where the ethical ground is, as someone who's in that conversation. But I do think that the other piece that we're not talking about is because they see themselves as good people and they can't hold the idea that good people could do bad things, there's a real struggle for people mm -hmm. around this topic. Mm -hmm. And at least that's what I run into whenever I try to bring it up. And the other thing I would say is that if you go online and you look at colleges, the number of colleges at Halloween that have people doing stuff in blackface, people in sumo outfits, this hasn't gone away. This has not gone away on the college campus in the U.S., sadly. Mm -hmm. And I think to take what Sherwood said, what Matt, Matt sort of questioned earlier, how do you get engaged? We're an educational institution. Now, we all may not wear an educator hat and be in the classroom every day and whatnot, but I believe it's part of my role to have those conversations if I can. And so it's environmentally, how can I engage people and begin to have that conversation without absolution? There was another hand. Yeah. I was just going to say that I think that what you're saying is really true and that that's still the exact same issue that I see today with peer students or other individuals, white people especially, um, who just like really feel as though they're good people and probably, you know, like I've had a hard time wrapping my own mind around like that whole thing. Like we might know maybe some like older relatives of mine or something like that who I believe, love and believe are good people but might have these like really terrible sort of either practices or ideas or whatever. And I just think that's an important like thread that still continues right to now. It's hard to talk about these issues, I think. And um, but yeah, like what you're saying, finding ways to, you know, have people understand that. You know, it doesn't mean you're necessarily a bad person. I think that's like so much of like the whole like mm -hmm. white guilt and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I myself mm -hmm. went through that a lot when I was y much younger and trying to like wrap my mind around all these issues. And it was like very, I felt like very ill about the entire thing. And like took, you know, just like it takes time and work. And people don't want to have to go through that because it's painful. Um, but it is, you know, possible. Um, I don't know. Well, you know, I, I think another part of it, Cakewalk, as as part of UVM, was an institutional thing. What Sherwood's talking about, sort of appears, not as much as an institutional thing, is tied to like a pocket within a campus. And then for me, the question is, how does how does people respond real time, or immediately following to that? Because it's that's we're at a different place than we were back when Cakewalk was happening, but it's again it's one of those things to where it it's it's happened on virtually every college campus. It happens over there this year, and they have a level of education, and students become way more uh, informed and make better decisions for at least four years because those students will graduate in four years. So you've got so no problems over here, but then this campus over at this end of the country has it. And they go through the same process. And then this campus back over here, after another five or six or seven years, you got a whole new group of students in who are coming in and saying, well, yeah, I saw it on TV, so it's OK. Well, it's not OK. So it is. It's part. It's not. It hasn't left. It just appears differently. Yeah? So Pat Brown, you've been here for a couple of years. And, um, and I'm wondering what your thoughts and reflections are about what would be possible at UVM 2015 around that sense of ritual, that sense of community. Because it was really striking at me, although the racism piece was is hard to watch, I appreciate, yep, it took a lot of work. I mean, the, the creating a whole theatrical thing, the sets, the, the physical stamina, I mean, a lot of effort went into creating this, it just, the, this unfortunately was really bad, but I think that piece around mobilizing resources, energy, talent, your physical self, creative self, to create something um, as a community is something that I think is very powerful, the ritual around that as well as the coming together as community. UVM is a lot bigger than we were 
back when it was in its heyday, do you see, or what do you see as the possibility for creating a sense of community around a community ritual? Well, I would clarify that it needs to be a positive, yes. low-risk community ritual. <laughs> um, because that's, that's an important component. And, and there's this point, because I could talk about the naked bike ride, which if you don't, all you don't know, many in the College of Medicine, I don't think your students are participating, but if in your emergency room, they'd be dealing with our students who come in. Yep, chafing. Yep, so sometimes there's frostbite issues. There's multiple things. But uh, an undergraduate tradition started on our campus a number of years ago on the last day of classes at midnight just to have a naked bike ride. It's now basically a naked run. And in December, we'll probably have five to 700 people running around naked around um, a loop. This is, the past couple of years has been by CBW. Uh, the construction's going to like, where are we going to go next year? Uh, they'll have some issues with where it's going to re where it's going to pop up. Um, but that's part of what happens, and people really get hurt. We have probably 1,000 or 1,200 people do it in the springtime when the weather's a little nicer. Uh, if you talk to some students, that's it. Um, I, I don't want to believe that, but I could go back in. Right before I came here, um, the outing club used to do a spring river raft race, which was really cool. They would go down just below Bolton Dam. Folks would make sort of rafts, usually late at night, probably drinking too much beer, and they'd get in the water, and they would float down uh, through the railroad trestle. It's the only sort of white water on the Minooski River. Um, great idea. Uh, springtime, water's a little cold. So, you know, trying to manage it is like, okay, let's manage it. So let's sort of get a rescue boat with a motor, um, and let's try to make it work. So that happened. Uh, rescue boat flipped over because the rapids were a lot of water coming down the mountain. Bunch of students couldn't get down to the, over on the river road, so they decided to drive around and park themselves on the interstate and pull off the interstate on a big area there and had basically a big party on the interstate. Oh, that was the last year that happened. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it, there are, it's like one of those interesting kinds of things. Does it come from students? And it, does it start safe? The naked bike ride started safe. It was a group of students from our Living Learning Center. I often joke with John Sama that this is really his program, and he still should own it, uh, from the Mountain Lions, who a group of students sort of said, yeah, let's go have fun. And it wasn't necessarily at midnight, but they just started riding their bikes around naked. And then it sort of grew from there. So it's a challenge. You know, we don't have any facilities that we could fit 9,000 students in. That's the problem, if you want to really put everybody in. Many of us grow up in this country, think about football as sort of the place where you go. Well, we don't have a football team. We've got club football, a uh, completely different level. Uh, our, so sports ends up being one of those things for a lot of places. And you know, we, our facilities, we only give away 700 tickets to students for hockey um, and basketball. Mm. We all like a winning team. Go Patriots. I don't care about the football, but anyway. Uh, one last question or comment? Yeah. Um, do you know if, if Winter Carnival was ever associated with like ski racing? Because I know where I went to school, yep. that was like what our Winter Carnival was, like all the ski races, and then yep. there was like a dance and stuff. Yep. So, so they're actually, when the ski team, there's always these noise, the, not noise, name conflicts. So when our ski team travels around, they're usually referred to the ski competition as Winter Carnival. Uh, in my time here, when I first started working here, it was, Pat, here, here, make this happen, because it may be one of those events. And it was broom ball. And we played broom ball, and we would have 125 teams on and off campus. Uh, we played outside. Uh, I'd have physical plant build these courts. Uh, at the end of broom ball season, I would always get a, um, a doc report from Bill Christmas, who was the head of the Student Health Center, how many teeth we lost, how many fractured knees we had, how many stitches in total, because we're not sort of club sports campus recreation people. We were throwing it together, and students were having a great time. Uh, the drinking age was 18. People would come drink. We had no baseball team for a couple years. We did it actually under the lights down at uh, Centennial Field, which was just incredible. Um, and it got to the point where we didn't have enough snow, which we have that problem sometimes. And it, and it got to the point of the, the injury record was so much, we said, yeah, we need to give this to someone whose job is to really sort of manage that type of activity and train reps well. And we play outside, and if it was cold like today, one whistle blow, and you get a little spittle in the whistle, and the little ball doesn't move, you can't even blow the whistle. 
So we actually called all the, that, that for us was Winterfest weekend because we didn't want to conflict with Winter Carnival. So we've done a couple things to try to sort of have things happen around that time. So we still play broom ball. They still get the same number of teams. It's done completely differently, and it's played on the ice in the hockey rink. I played for the first time in the hockey rink about three weeks ago and got a little mini concussion because I got checked by somebody who will remain unnamed. <laughs> Any last statements? So I, for me, I hope this was informative. It's part of our history. And again, I want to reiterate that this was a very visible part of our history. And it doesn't take much to talk to students and really begin to learn that a lot of these, a lot of the behaviors that we look at this and react to still happen on campus. It's important for you to know that. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.